with landscape photography, sometimes the road is just as important as the destination. We are now starting to wind down our epic trip to New Zealand, but no trip to New Zealand would be complete without an epic road shot. So much of visiting New Zealand involves driving great distances and some of the most beautiful drives in the world are in this country. So sometimes you just can't help yourself. You got to pull the car over and just take a shot right from the road. This particular shot is one of my favorite road shots in New Zealand and it's really exciting because it touches a little bit more on that compression technique that we were talking about before. Remember back at the Church of the Good Shepherd when we went across the body of water and we zoomed in on the church so we could frame the mountains behind it? This is very similar. Mount Cook is actually very close to us, but take a look at what happens if we shoot this at a wide angle. At 24 millimeter, there's really nothing to it. That mountain is still so far away, but when you step out of the car and look at it, it feels so close. So just like last time, I'm gonna take the 70 to 200 and I'm gonna zoom in. For this shot in particular, it's gonna be right around 115 to 135 millimeters. Now take a look at this version now. This version looks great. You get all the benefits of the windy road and that mountain looks huge in the background. Now this is a good composition. All along this road towards Mount Cook that follows Lake Pukaki, this is the only time where you're in an elevated position and you see the winding road before you. So we scouted this road quite a bit back and forth, and this is by far the best place to get a shot like this. If I was just gonna jump out of the car and get a quick snapshot, I'd get right in the middle of the road. But I wanna do something a little bit more fun today, so I'm gonna get off the road just for safety purposes. Since we've already talked about compression, I want this to be a little bit more exciting. So this is the first time in this entire tutorial where we are going to introduce artificial light into a landscape. And in this case, we're gonna be capturing long light trails from the moving car. So we can really accentuate the twisting of the road. So in order for that to work, I'm gonna wait for a nice blue hour shot. And I have a really good benefit tonight. There's a big moon in the sky. So once blue hour starts to happen, I'm still gonna get some nice moonlight on the mountain and the countryside. And then I'm gonna wait for it to get a little bit darker. I'm gonna get the final blue hour shot. And then I'm gonna do some 30 second exposures to capture the cars going back and forth. Later on in Photoshop, I'm gonna add those trails back into my blue hour shot to create a nice composite image. I'm really excited about the shot and I'm also excited to finally introduce artificial light into landscapes. This is something that we cover extensively in the second tutorial video, but it's also something that we really have to take into consideration because while these places are very landscape oriented, sometimes there are man-made objects. And in this case, the road adds such a beautiful compositional element. And if you're gonna shoot at twilight, you can pick up extra light and detail from the cars driving by. So it really creates a full bodied, beautiful image. So I'm really excited to show you guys how we do that. Right now I'm set up pretty early and I'm actually capturing the sunset. Here's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the sun to set all the way. I'm waiting for the last bit of ambient light to still be in the sky before it gets full dark. The reason is I want the benefits of the ambient light. I still wanna see some detail in my foreground, in the road, in the trees, and in the mountain, but I also wanna be able to blend in the car trails. If I were to just come out here in the middle of the day shoot the mountain, there'd be no way I could blend in car trails because it would be completely unconvincing. So what I'm really looking for here is the perfect twilight shot with those car trails mixed in so the viewer thinks it's believable and not a composite. At this point, you guys might be wondering why I wouldn't try to get this in one shot. Why couldn't I just get the car trails and the mountain and everything at the perfect moment? Well, here's the thing. There are hardly any cars on this road. In fact, what I'm gonna probably have to do is have Lee and Patrick drive our bus back and forth down the road just so I can get enough car trails in time. Shooting at twilight instead of full dark gives me the advantage to work at a good f-stop. I can shoot at f8, probably 30 seconds at a very low ISO. And what happens when I do that is I get a crisp, clean, noise-free image. If I came out here just at night when it was pitch black, no matter what I did, even if I put things down to f2.8, 
ISO 3200 and a two minute exposure, everything in the foreground is still going to be very dark. And any of the detail that I'd be able to pull out would be so grainy that it would be unusable. So what I'm trying to do is get the best of both worlds. Perfect twilight shot, and then I'm just gonna blend those car trails into the scene. The other thing about blending the car trails into the scene is I don't think a car can make it from here all the way around the bend in 30 seconds. So I'm probably gonna have to do three, four, maybe even six different versions of the car trails and then blend them all together to make them look really thick and impactful. The sun's just about to set all the way, so I'm gonna go ahead and lock in all my settings and start shooting now. I wanna make sure I capture the perfect moment. Once I do, we'll start talking about the car trails. Phase one of capturing twilight is now complete. Here comes the fun part. It's time to capture the light trails from the moving vehicles. Big problem though, there are no moving vehicles now. We're actually kind of out here by ourselves. So what I'm gonna do is have Lee and Patrick get off of the cameras that they're using to video me. I'm gonna have them drive up and down this road over and over again. What I'm gonna do is set my camera to be able to take 30 second exposures. I'm not gonna use any filters or anything like that. I'm gonna turn my ISO down quite a bit and I'm gonna ramp up my f-stop as high as I need to go to be able to get a 30 second exposure. For car light trails, anywhere between 15 and 30 seconds works really well. So if this was a short road, I might use 15 seconds, but since it's a really long road, I wanna use 30. If they start to go over 30 and use bulb mode to time my own exposures, they won't leave much of an imprint on the frame. It feels like 30 seconds does a really good job with really hot lights where a minute exposure makes them a little bit soft and dull. So the next step is to have Lee and Patrick drive up and down this road so I can start capturing the car light trails. That was really fun. I had Lee and Patrick drive up and down this road and I was able to capture some really incredible light trails. I'm really excited to take this into Photoshop and see what it looks like. But before we do that, take a look at some of these trails I was able to capture. As you can see by some of these frames, the trails are really intense, but I've still managed to expose a little bit for the environment as well. Even though it was total dark, I always like a little wiggle room in blending. So if I just had a light trail, in the dark, just pitch black, just with the light trail going through. I could use a blending mode like Lighten to put it on top of a layer underneath. In that case, it would have been the blue hour. But if I would have done that, it would have been semi-transparent and I would have had to bring that value back up. So by exposing for the scene as well with the light trails, I have a little bit more wiggle room. I can just mask that in over top of the layer and then feather the opacity and change the blending mode from there. So it gives me a little bit more flexibility in post-processing and gives me a little bit more of a powerful and impactful light trail. So to capture all these trails that I just showed you guys, I wanted it to be as long of an exposure as possible without having to time them on my own. This makes it easy to just lock down the trigger. And now this took about, I timed about 50 seconds for Lee to get all the way from the bottom of the road, all the way to the top of the top, all the way to the bottom, which means I had to take two consecutive exposures. So I just locked it down and took two consecutive 30 second exposures. It shouldn't be a problem at all to just blend those two together seamlessly in Photoshop. So I managed to capture quite a few different light trails in different positions. Uh, I'm gonna bring all that into Photoshop and I'm gonna see what works best. It was a little bit weird with the headlights, got a little intense right next to my frame, so I may dim that down a little bit. I'm not sure as of yet. Once I get into post, I'll make those decisions and see what works best. Bear in mind that this shot works really well without the car trails. It's already naturally beautiful, but I think adding elements like this make it unique and make it your own. So let's bring all this into post and put it all back together. Welcome back to the studio, everybody. This is lesson 14. I'm calling it the road to Mount Cook. If you remember back from the video, this is where I zoomed in with a telephoto lens, 
compress the landscape so I get Mount Cook very, very big in the background. So the idea was to be able to combine a static shot with the perfect lighting and then combining those light trails uh, to, to add more interest on the road and leading lines down that long, winding road. Now this is also a special shot because it's the first time that I'm introducing artificial light and combining it with natural light in the scene. Let's take a look at this inside of Capture One. Now this is a very interesting scene because we set up very early and I established the shot that I wanted. And before the sun decided to set, I still had a little bit light on the mountain, but as day uh, turned into night, an annoying thing happened. The clouds started covering up Mount Cook. So this is a very iconic mountain. It's one of the most famous mountains in New Zealand. So it was very important to me to preserve the mountain. I would have liked to have the twilight, the lighting of the twilight, because it's easier to composite, but with the clouds covering the mountain, I really didn't like it. So what I have to do here, and what we're gonna have to do, is combine this, this near sunset shot with these night shots. So let's take a look at what we have. This is gonna be our base layer here. We're gonna do some color adjustments, and then we're gonna combine these layers together. There are actually seven different sets of car trails that we're gonna blend together to get a continuous line down this road. So let's go ahead and get started with this one. Now the first thing I want to do is make some basic adjustments. So this is interesting because we're actually effectively I'm going to try to transform this daytime image into something that works for a nighttime image. Obviously combining car trails during the day, that's something we'd never see because the lights wouldn't be on during the day. It's really something that happens at the twilight, the blue hour, or at full dark. So the first thing I'm going to do is start to adjust this down uh, to compensate so that when I add some of this light in, it'll look more natural. It won't look too out of place. So let's make some basic adjustments. So instead of enhancing the highlights in this case, I'm going to start to bring them down. So I'm going to underexpose this just a little bit because the sky was a little too exposed. And I'm going to recover the highlights a little bit just to bring down the intensity of the sky and the highlight on this mountain right here. The next thing I'm going to do is pull the shadows up just so I have a nice, even base to work with. And I'm going to decide that looks pretty good, something just like that. Maybe I'll pull this out just a little bit more, leave that. And with a setting, I think that looks pretty good. I'm not doing all the day-to-night stuff here. I just want to have a good base to work with when we start to do the blend. Once we get these other layers in, we'll be able to take a look. So let's get this into Photoshop. Right-click, Export Variants. And change this back to 8-bit. Now I've already loaded some other layers, so I'm actually going to take this and bring it into the PSD that I've already created. I created a PSD here with my base layer so we could see our adjustments right away. Previously I've been bringing this in the last step. This time I wanted to do it during the first step. So I'll paste this in and this is going to be our base layer. Let's go back to Capture One, clear this notification, and now let's take a look at the lights. So from here to here, there's quite a big difference. We went from a late afternoon all the way into a blue hour and almost full dark, so the lighting has completely changed. Well, I wanna take advantage of this because the way that we can layer light together is the same technique that we use for star trails or any type of light stacking, and that's using the light and blending mode. So let's get one of these into Photoshop so that I can show you exactly how it works. I'm gonna pick this one here, just the one with the nice long tail lights going all the way to the back of the scene. Right click, export variants again. We'll go ahead and bring this into our layer, copy it, close it, and paste it. And you can see that it has changed dramatically. It also has shifted. My camera has shifted a little bit, so we're going to have to address that. It's a few pixels higher, or the camera shifted lower, which makes this scene a little bit higher, so we're going to have to fix that. But basically, in order to blend these lights in with this background, we just change the blending mode to lighten. And you can see that now those car trails just pop right in. But you can also see when I turn it on and off, that the pixels do move, so we're gonna have to adjust this. So the next step is to go back to Capture One and figure out which ones we wanna use. Remember, I had Lee and Patrick drive all the way down the road because it's about a two minute drive to three minutes from all the way here in the background all the way past here. So I wanted to be able to combine the near lights and the very distant lights here in the back background. So effectively, I wanna bring all seven layers into Photoshop, and I can do that the same way I've been exporting things, select them all, export them all as variants, and then bring them into my PSD. To save a little bit of time here, I've already done that here in Photoshop, and I can show you the result. So we'll get rid of this one that I brought in. Inside of this folder here, and I'm gonna move this right to the top, this is all seven of those layers. So basically, the first thing that I wanna address is I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in a little bit here. 
And you can see if I toggle this on and off, you can see that those pixels have actually moved a little bit. So what I'm going to do is just using the nudge tool, which is just the arrow keys, I'm going to go ahead and move these down. One, two, three, four, five pixels. And I'm just going to turn it on and off just to see. And I'm basically just going to move it into position here until I get it to be really close and matched. And again, this is not an exact science, unfortunately, but since we're using a blending mode, it's going to be okay. So I just want that to be as close as possible. That looks pretty good. So with this folder now containing all seven of the layers, what I want to do is take all of these layers and turn them to the lighten blending mode. And when they're all turned to the lighten blending mode, you can see that now these light trails pop right in. With these light trails popping right in, you can see that we're also getting some negative effects. These little highlights here, these are funny little things that happen because the light is actually hitting the front of my lens. So that's unfortunate, we have to fix that. And also I don't like this light that's happening here in the background on this water. I also don't like this one spot in the background. Pretty happy with all this, that looks pretty good. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and selectively mask in or out the area that I want this to exist in. So right now, uh, I think it's gonna be easier to just go ahead and create a mask and paint out the areas that I don't want. So remember what I said here, we're gonna go ahead and use uh, a black paintbrush here. We're gonna go ahead and brush out those highlights on the water, which I do not like. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more and I'm gonna get rid of this guy right in the background here. I don't like that, that one light, we'll get rid of that. And then some of these highlights along the mountain here, I'm just gonna go ahead and clean these up. I don't need these to be there. Even something like this, obviously this is a mistake. Uh, that's something that's a problem. Any of these little loops, these little problems here, go ahead and just paint them out uh, right out of the right off the bat. But you can see if I paint out the sign, I'm losing some of that lighting. So I'm going to be really careful here to just paint out some of it. Uh, I'm going to use a very light hand on my brush and a very low flow to make sure that I can just paint out some of this. Same thing with this area here. It doesn't look bad. I'm just not a big fan of the red. I feel like it it doesn't really look that good. It looks kind of color burnt. So we're just going to go ahead and fade fade some of this out. Let's get rid of some of those negative effects uh, that are happening here on the lens. And I'll just clean that up a little bit more. We'll also take a look here. These little squiggly lines are fine. All of that is fine. All of this looks good. Again, here's some of that red color. We want some of the lighting to affect it, but we don't want any of these weird shades or artifacts. And maybe a little bit off of here too. Turn it on and off. You can see, missed a spot here in the water. Go ahead and clean that up as well. We want to make sure that our blend's fully intact before we move on. Well, that's starting to look pretty good. So we got the car trails in there pretty easily. Well, something I want to point out here is I have, I've done my best to select different parts of the car trails. And you can see that I can actually stack these up. So we have a few in the background. They'll stack up and connect. And then we have the ones in the foreground actually starting to connect. But there are a few gaps. And the gaps can be kind of a problem. The biggest gap here is from this spot to this spot. So let's find that layer in the background. Let's figure out which layer accounts for that spot. It's this one right here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take the clone stamp on this layer and I'm actually just going to go ahead and clone in some of this color. Just this color right here and I'm going to leave the flow as is and I'm just going to start painting in some of this just so it blends in. And what I want to do is kind of get some of that in there and I screwed that up so I'm going to do it one more time the lower opacity, I'm going to go ahead and start blending in some of that car trail light. Now, the clone stamp might not be the best tool. So what I haven't shown you guys yet, if you don't want to use the clone stamp, since this is basically just color, we can use a paintbrush instead. And we can use a soft edge paintbrush. And if I select, holding the option key, a color, I can actually roll across the image and select the color that I want to paint. Then I can actually just paint light in, just like this. So instead of using the clone stamp, I can go ahead and bridge that connection back in, uh, I can grab some of this yellow here, and I can paint some of the yellow to make it seem like it's a connected line. So I can basically just create this. Now I'm making this up as I go along because it's a non-crucial element. It's part of the background. Uh, it really doesn't matter. I just want the line to seem as though it's completely connected. So now you can see that that layer completely connects the background and connects it here as well. So just a little bit more cleanup, just like that, and I'll zoom out. So now it looks like we have a seamless line all the way from the background, all the way to the foreground. So this is actually starting to look pretty good and we haven't done much already. Just a basic adjustment and now we brought in these layers. But let's take a closer look here. If we go back to Capture One, 
Well, notice the lighting here. It's nice. I mean, I've lost all the lighting on the foreground, beautiful light on the mountain, which I really like. But watch what happens when the cars get close to the foreground. Notice we start to get lighting here. Look at this image here. Notice how we start to get lighting here on the bank. In fact, this one, this image here, has the most lighting on the bank here. If I go to this image again, you can see that there's no real lighting. So what would happen if I maybe use some of the light from this object, not just these car trails, what would happen if I use some of the light to add some of the light back in to the image? Well, let's go ahead and do that. But before we do that, we have to color correct it. Because remember, every time we blend things together, it's better to bring them closer to each other so that we don't have extreme edges of blending. Right now, this is way too dark. But since it's way too dark, I could probably just bring the shadows up a little bit to compensate. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to bring the shadows up. I'm going to recover the highlights just a little bit. And I'm going to bring it back to something that's a little bit more close in tonality. You can see that now I'll have highlights and I'll have some shadows. So this is really a powerful feature. Let's go ahead and export this. It's another variant. Bring it into Photoshop. All right, let's copy it again. Now I'm going to put this, we'll go ahead and put this below the light trails because those just lighten on top and I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. Same problem here, we had a little bit of a shift. So if I turn this on and off, you can see that that does shift. I'm just going to use the arrow keys to nudge it and just fix it. Just bring it right back into place here. Uh, looks almost right. That looks good. The reason it shifted was because I was triggering the cameras over and over again. I had the tripods locked down as much as possible, but even a slight move, if, if you have the tripod set up and it was on like a little pebble and that pebble shifts just a tiny little bit, I'm so zoomed in at telephoto that any tiny disturbance to the camera is going to throw the whole thing off. So this isn't that big of a deal because I'm not doing crucial blending, but just bear in mind that anytime you're planning on blending multiple elements into the scene, I can't stress enough that the tripod stays in the same place. In this case, there's not any parallax, so the shift isn't that big of a deal to remedy just with a quick uh, pixel movement here. So again, I like most of this image. I just want to use the highlights. I'm going to change this to lighten and see what happens. And you can see that if I change it to lighten, now I'm picking up just those highlights in the foreground that I, I really want. I'm also getting these negative ones back. So I'm going to mask this out here just by holding Option, clicking the Mask button, and I'm going to paint these highlights back in. That's all I'm going to do, and I'm going to use a light-handed, uh, low amount of flow here to actually just go ahead and paint these highlights back in. Very quickly I can get those highlights back. I may want to bring some of them on the road a little bit too. You can see that I get these nice highlights on the road and these natural highlights here in the grass. It's starting to look really nice. Oh, that looks pretty good. Let's back it up and take a look. Yeah, not bad at all. So far, so good. So let's take a look at what we've done here. So first thing that we've done now is we've basically manage the light, and you can see how that looks. With these layers on top, you can see how it's all starting to blend in. So we've added seven layers, seven layers set to the light and blending mode to get all of these car trails in, and we're using a daytime shot. So, so far it's starting to look good, but now it's time to move on to the next step. Now that we've done all the blending, it's time to move on and start matching the color and contrast. With a scene like this, we're really playing with an interpretation of reality, meaning that we're taking a day shot and adding in elements of the night. Even if we were just combining twilight elements though, we're still taking liberty with the car trails and adding a element that's unnatural with an element that's natural. That's something I really like to do is, is blend uh, natural and artificial light together, but this is the first time we've actually done it and it's looking kind of good. And what I want to do now is start color correcting the difference and then working to enhance the details, sharpening, and all those other things that we usually do in the image. But the first thing I want to do is to just find anything that looks out of place. And obviously some things that will look out of place, uh, for example, we know that we get spots on the lenses. So if we zoom into the top here, you can see there are some spots. So the first thing I want to do is go ahead and remove those spots. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing it right now because we can zap those out as we go but I just want to get rid of some of the big annoying ones that I know are going to haunt me later. So that's the first thing that I usually do is clean up. So clean up means getting rid of birds, ducks, anything. Spots on the lens, spots on the sensor, anything that's out of place, anything that's going to look like it's a mistake. So that's very important. 
And as I'm removing these, I'm looking for anything else that might be wrong in the image. If we take a look at the whole image again, you also have to identify if anything stands out. So in the last file in Pancake Rocks, I got rid of a rock in the foreground. But this, whatever it is, whether it's a leaf, a piece of dirt, dust, or, uh, you know, granola bar, it doesn't matter. We just have to get rid of it. In my opinion, it just distracts from the scene. It's not something that I want to have there because it pulls attention away. Another thing that pulls attention away is the way that this curve changes. Notice the curve goes and this wraps around. I'd like this line to terminate perfectly and lead the eye into the frame. So with this on the top here, what I'm going to do, the clone stamp, I'm going to go ahead and clone that back in. I'm just going to pick a brush size that's kind of medium here, a nice flow, and I'm actually just going to grab that line and paint so that it continues, and it just continues on. I'm also going to grab some of this here, and I'm going to continue it on so that we get some of the grass and some of the detail down there. Very, very easy. Now here I can actually get rid of some of the other elements that I created, so there's no duplication. And then I have basically something that just leads right in to the edge of the frame. It doesn't wrap around the edge of the frame, just leads right down. And I know that may seem like a small thing to worry about, but it's something that I like to have in my images is nothing distracting, nothing that looks like it's a mistake. So it gives me the opportunity to just correct uh, things that I couldn't correct in camera. And that looks pretty good. It was a little bit noisy, got rid of most of the spots, so it's time to go on to the next step. At this point, I kind of want to address one issue. Now, I know when I go into Color Effects Pro, I'm going to be able to make everything jump, all the colors pop, and everything look unified. But the first problem is, is I have way more light in the background than I do in the foreground, meaning that I want to do some sort of adjustment here. So before I get into anything else, before I call this blend complete, I'm going to make up for this being a daytime sky by changing the contrast a little bit and making it look a little bit more like night. Now it's never going to look like night because there's light. You could tell somebody it was moonlight and they'd probably believe you, but for all intents and purposes, we're just trying to get it to look more balanced. So you can see with curves adjusted here, if I bring everything down, you can see that that mountain darkens up and everything darkens up in the foreground. So what I want to do is bring those values, make them darker values, but I like the highlight on the mountain. In fact, I like it more than the night shot. So I want to try to retain some of those highlights and some of that vividness but I want to drop the shadows. Now since I don't want this to happen in the foreground, I'm going to use the gradient tool and I'm going to isolate it so that it only happens from here to here. And you can see that I have before and after and I'm starting to basically change that tonality and match it. And I'll make some more adjustments now that's selective. That's starting to look pretty good. I'll select all these, I'll add them to a folder here and I'll name that folder blend as I usually do. I'll go ahead and duplicate this layer with that hotkey, command, shift, option, E. That'll make one layer so that I can go back into my favorite filters, Color Effects Pro. Awesome. Let's do Pro Contrast first. And as I start to do this, it's nice with Pro Contrast. It really pops up those highlights, makes it look a little bit more crisp. Uh, correct Contrast is going to darken it up a little bit. I want to be careful. I want to protect some of the shadows. And if we do a Correct color cast. I'm pretty sure it's going to warm everything up, which is nice. Warm it up just a hair, and we'll add another filter. Now, I really want this to pop because if it's a night shot, think about the way that the light works. It's going to be heavily contrasty. It's not going to be soft. It's going to have anywhere that these lights are hitting are going to be much more contrasty than the surrounding pixels. So by using something like contrast color range, I can exaggerate that contrast a little bit. We've been using this a lot, and it's really a great... I find myself using it in landscape photography all the time. So we'll go ahead and do the color contrast here, and you can see that that's going to pop those values out. It's going to pop these values out, and it's just going to make this look more crisp, uh, and it's going to make it look a little bit more vibrant and detailed. That actually looks pretty good to me. Let's go, let's go ahead and click OK, apply the result. That looks really nice. Here we go. We're starting to transform this scene, get some of that detail back, and unify the composition that we've worked so hard to create. So right now it's starting to look pretty good. Here's where I want to start adding that sharpening back in. I'm not going to use Nick Sharpener. I'm actually just going to use a high pass because I don't want to use too much sharpening. Um, I just want it to have a little bit more crisp detail in the foreground. So I'll set this to overlay and you can see it pops all that detail out. Now I want this to be selective and uh, so in order to do that I'm going to go ahead and black out the mask and I'm going to select the brush, a white paintbrush, 
and uh, heavy flow, flow around 60 or 70 percent. And I'm also going to go to quick mask mode and I'm going to paint in the area that I want to have detail. So I really want detail here in the foreground on the road. I do not want detail in the water. I really want it here on this side bank here and uh, right around here. But you know what? I don't want it in the mountain. I want to keep that a little bit more soft in the background. I want all the focus on the details of the road. There's no reason to sharpen these lines too much. If you overlap, don't worry about it. That's just going to sharpen that area and look pretty good. So let's zoom in now. Let's take a look at the details. Now here, since I've added that color effects, um, we're going to start to see some more of these spots now that's heavier contrast. And again, we're just going to start zapping those things out as we see them. That might have been a bird. It could have been another spot on the sensor. It's hard to tell. Traveling with the f-stoppers, it could be a drone. It could be any number of things that you have to clean and paint out. That's all looking really nice here. There's just a few little problems. A few more little problems. Well, something that I might want to do here is pull some of the details of the mountain up a little bit. Because right now it's dramatic, but I want it to be a little bit more dramatic. So with this Color Effects Pro uh, selected, I'm going to add some tonal contrast to it. So we'll go back to Color Effects Pro and add some tonal contrast. I really want to pop that cloud out and I want to pop the details and chisel the details of the mountains while simultaneously adding contrast in the midtones. Tonal contrast, we'll go ahead and change this to the normal settings somewhere like 8. This is going to be heavy, so it's going to be 12, 12, no saturation. And if I do a before and after here, you can see that that's really starting to pop some of the details here, which is exactly what I want. I'll say OK. That looks really good. I'm going to do something a little bit different here because I love what it's doing to the background. I like about 40% of what it's doing to the foreground. So I'm going to create a mask here and I'm going to create another gradient ramp so that I have the sky selected and it's going to fade off as it gets down to the bottom. Maybe about there to there. So 100% to 0%. But right now this is 0% because it's black. So I want this to be affected a little bit. So I'm going to change the effect of the mask by double clicking and changing the density. Zero makes it completely see-through, so it's 100%, and then 100% makes the mask applied so that this part is not going to have any tonal contrast. So any density that I change along the way, I can start to pull out, and you can see this changing to shades of gray, so I can start to get rid of some of that effect but still have a little bit in the foreground and a lot in the background. And that looks really good. And since I love the way this looks, um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and bake it into a single layer like I usually do, because the next step, now that we've added all that tonal contrast, the next step is to do some softening, to get rid of all that noise that I've accidentally created by adding tonal contrast. Remember, the more contrast you add in the sky, the more noise it's going to add. So we'll go ahead and mitigate that noise by adding another filter, and we'll add a define. Out of the box, Define did a pretty good job, but I'm going to go ahead and manually select the bounding box that I wanted to measure the noise. I'm all the way up in the corner, which is where we're going to have the worst noise of the image, and I'm going to go ahead and measure that noise again. It'll only take a moment. Now when I slide this before and after, you can see very noisy, very clean, and you can see another spot on the lens that I'll have to get rid of. I'll apply it and wait for the effect. Great. Let's go ahead and zoom out there. So we know that the sky now and the mountain is going to have uh, a lot, it has a lot more tonal contrast, so we have to mitigate the noise a little bit. Really I only want this to exist in the sky and the mountain. I don't want to get rid of any of the texture and detail in the foreground. So basically it's going to be a 100% to 0% transition uh, for the define, which is going to get rid of the noise. So we've gotten rid of the noise there. And this image, I think it's actually almost done. It's very contrasty, it's very dramatic. These light trails are pretty awesome. They go all the way around the side of the mountain. At this point, I need to do any additional color corrections that I might want to do. And I may want to change the contrast a little bit in the sky. I'm going to add another curves layer. Just one more final tweak that we do here. And I'm going to bring those, the highlights up just a little bit and the shadows back down. So I'm basically going to create even more contrast in the sky just to pop those details a little bit more. And I'm going to change one more gradient ramp just to bring this effect home. So now I have even more 
detail and contrast in the sky. At this point, it could be the moon illuminating this mountain, or it could be the start of a day or something like that, and it looks really good. The only thing I don't like about this is the overall composition. I feel there's too much sky. So in this case, I usually don't crop my images because uh, I like to have them full size, four to three. If a client asks for a crop image or I'm going to make a panorama, then I do it later, but I always leave everything intact. So I'm not going to crop this image, but I'm going to kind of show you what would look good. So with the crop tool enabled, you can see that this is really kind of a panoramic image. There's a lot of just empty space in the sky. Just by compressing this down a little bit, something like that, you can see if I hit return and enter and get rid of those pixels, then it pulls that focus really just into this area here. So you can see that I get the light trails lead into the mountain and I lose the top of the sky. So anything like that, in this case, I'd recommend probably doing additional cropping if this is going to go into your portfolio. It would also really work well uh, in video resolution at 1920 or 16 by 9 format instead of 4 to 3. But as I said, I like to leave all my images into 4 to 3 so that I can crop them later, depending on how I want to keep it. And keep in mind that we might not just want to crop this later wide. Let's say we're working for uh, something with Instagram. In Instagram, I'd want to be able to keep the original ratio so I can maybe make a square image, uh, something like this, to post to Instagram. So you can see some nice interest in the mountain. Uh, we could do something interesting like that as well. So leaving everything intact just gives you the options to crop things down to the way you want to use them, and that depends on the way you want to share them. So just something else to keep in mind since we're getting close to the end of this tutorial series. Basically, this is one of those images where the complexity really lied more with the compositing of everything, but the color correction was very simple because the scene itself is very simplistic. So one last time, let's take a look at where we started and where we took it. So if we would have just stopped the car, figured out the compression shot, and gotten the nice late rays of the sun, we would have ended up with a shot like this. So already very beautiful, but not very unique. Anybody can stop here and take this photo. But by stopping here, taking this photo, and waiting for nighttime, and then driving the car back and forth, we were able to go from something like this, which already looks pretty nice, to something like this, which is completely unique. This is a perspective of this mountain with conditions that you're not going to see repeated too often. So it's a way that we can create something completely different and very unique for our portfolio. That wraps it up for this lesson. I hope you guys enjoyed the basics of how to blend natural and artificial light. Wow, it's been an incredible almost two months of filming for this project from Iceland all the way through New Zealand. We're ending here in Queenstown. Lee, Patrick, and myself, we've all had an incredible time sharing these locations with you guys, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. I'm a 100% self-taught photographer, and it's taken me so many years to learn all of this stuff that we've managed to pack into this single tutorial. So I hope that this helps propel your artwork and your photography to the next level. I hope you can watch this and get amazing shots because of it. But just because this tutorial is over doesn't mean that we have to stop spending time together. Please feel free to reach out to me on any social media. I'm really big and really responsive on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and on 500px. So please feel free to message me anytime on that. If you purchase this, you're also going to get a link to an exclusive Facebook group where we can keep up on the images and talk all the time about the work and your progression. So if you ever have any questions about the stuff that we've gone over in this tutorial or you want to take things to the next level and you have questions for me personally, feel free to ping me anytime. I would be delighted to respond.
Not a day goes by where I'm not thankful that I was able to make my dream of becoming a professional and full-time travel photographer a reality. While I've shared so many of my favorite techniques in this entire tutorial, what I encourage you to do is to take those techniques and then make them your own. Take what you've learned and then develop your own style. That's the best way for you to make a name for yourself in photography and to succeed in the photography business. So again, everyone, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for sharing this adventure with us. I hope you loved every second of it. I hope you've learned as much as you possibly could from it. It was an amazing experience. And again, please continue to follow me on social media and ask me any question at any time. I'm always happy to answer. But wait, there's more. We've said that we went from Iceland to New Zealand, but actually there were a few countries in between. We actually went from Iceland to Italy, to Singapore, to Hong Kong, to Cambodia, all before we got here to New Zealand because we were actually working on two different video tutorials. So while you guys have just experienced the entire landscape tutorial, there is another full length tutorial that's gonna be coming out a few months from now. And where this one taught us everything we need to know about landscape photography and how to post process beautiful images, the next one takes it 10 steps further. deal with combining natural landscapes with urban landscapes, natural light with artificial light. We do advanced blending, time blending. We do all sorts of amazing compositing tricks that take our images so many steps further that it's an entire genre altogether. It's an amazing journey. Traveling to all these locations like Italy, we have Cinque Terre, where we have some of the most beautiful old architecture in some of the most beautiful coastal landscape villages. In Rome, we have ancient architecture where we balance artificial light with natural light in some of the most historically significant places in Europe. We go to Singapore and Hong Kong to some of the most spectacular cityscapes in the world and learn how to photograph them at their absolute best. We even take it a few hundred years in the past and we go to Angkor Wat where we're dealing with some of the most iconic and well-preserved ancient temple structures in the world where we have to balance silhouettes with beautiful fiery skies. It's amazing. And to top it all off, we end up coming back here to New Zealand to teach you guys everything you need to know about shooting the night sky and the astrophotography. We deal with shooting the Milky Way and even star trails. So that whole second tutorial is gonna help you take your images to the next level. It's gonna be amazing.